I remember pre the first time I preached at Crown College for Clarence Sexton in their chapel. I forget what I preached on, but uh, I made a big point that I'm not for double inspiration either. And they were looking at me like a calf looking at a new gate. They thought that's what I believed. And I was just like, just like he said, I came in with a Tyndale New Testament. And I held that William Tyndale New Testament up and I said, in its day, that book right here was no less inspired than this King James Bible is right here. And they don't believe the King James is even inspired. But I believe Tyndale, I believe Wycliffe, I believe anything God ever used had his breath on it. Duh, what's so hard about that? They think, they don't, they think we think nothing up till the King James Bible was the inspired Word of God. They create that. It's a straw man. They made up their own position that they accuse us of believing, and we don't even believe that. And I appreciated that message, Brother Sluter. That was really good. The three Ds. You know, the devil is, um, oh, by the way, after that message was over at Crown College, the Greek teacher who's in heaven tonight, a nice man, but dumb on these issues like they all are. His name was Kaiser, a good man. <clears throat> he came up to me at the book table, coming up to me like a bear hug. I mean, like a grizzly bear. Then he gave me a big hug. He was hugging type guys, you know. And he wanted to hug me to let me know he wasn't mad at me because of what I said there. Uh, he's the Greek teacher, okay? I mean, I felt so much better when he told me that. Amen. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> one of the things I can tell you is the devil, and, and the devil is certainly trying to fight this meeting. Uh, when you've been around a long time, you can sense that stuff. And you good church people here, you know, you spiritual church members, you can sense the same thing. I mean, the pastor's mother, my, you know, in that burning car, my brother, my, my half-brother died in his truck in a fire. Uh, I don't know whether he committed suicide or he was shot by the police in Miami. It's a kind of a controversy. I got the police report one time about as fat as a phone book like that. But he burned up in a car after uh, shooting uh, his shotgun through his next door neighbor's front door, a Cuban guy, because he wouldn't turn his music off. Terrible way to die. So it's a blessing that the preacher's mother was pulled out in time. But that's a, you know, I know that, you know, I know the preacher's been through it. Did you notice when he was standing up here, his hair was messed up? <laughs> his hair is never messed up. It was messed up. I hope mine's okay now. <laughs> the, uh, and uh, the, um, the weather, the, you know, a week ago, or I mean, three, four days ago, anyway, in Tennessee, we were hearing the worst weather predictions for this, you know, Siberian, you know, uh, 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 storm coming through this part of the country. They were predicting all kind of terrible uh, uh, snow accumulation. And um, then uh, Brother Patterson was going to be here tonight. And he, I, I'd known him, I'd known Jack for 40 uh, something years, and I've never heard him cry till tonight. He's in Detroit, he was planning on being here, but he can't hardly walk today. You know, he has to have surgery coming up in December for that accident, car accident they got in, and he was planning on being here tonight for sure, he's gonna sing. And so, by the way, I'm glad you young folks got to hear Brother Sluter, because I know he had a great influence on you uh, that last camp. I mean, Sluter out-preached Jack and I hands down, and that was very humbling for us to accept that. Jack didn't believe it, but I had to convince him that it happened. Are you kidding me? All those teenagers gave their testimony and up. Well, three sermons I blessed me the most tonight. I think at least I got one shot. All three of them would have been was Sluter sermons. That kind of remember that night? It was very depressing. <clears throat> but I'm I'm glad that he's here tonight so you can get some more blessing. Blah blah blah. Hey, listen, neighbor. I'm telling you, neighbor. Exactly one month ago today, October 15th. I was driving from Milwaukee, Wisconsin to, um, to Mechanicsville, Maryland, 13-hour drive through the night, 2 a.m. in Pennsylvania, hit the biggest deer in the history of America, sent him into the next dispensation. I never even saw what happened to him, I never did. And my van was wiped out. Uh, the only good news is it had 240,000 miles on it, so I didn't really lose much. I didn't have any insurance to replace it. And, uh, you know, I drove two more hours in that wrecked condition, no headlight, airbags blown out on the side of the van, every kind of a rattling noise. You know, it would rattle for a while, then stop rattling. <laughs> My son is a policeman there in Tennessee. He said, if I would got caught in Virginia doing that, they'd have put me in an electric chair, amen. 
you know, and I sold that van for 100 hours that night in a junkyard. That was tough on me, and I was marooned, literally. But uh, the Lord came through, and uh, he just said, uh, you, be, you wouldn't believe how much money he sent into me in 15 days. One five. You understand what 15 means? 15 days. Uh, well, I'll give you a hint here. I, I, I have a note here, $2,294. You see that figure? That's how much money I paid yesterday for the sales tax for the vehicle that I bought to replace that wrecked van. I mean, I'm telling you, neighbor, I had $34,000 come into my mailbox in 15 days. And you know, I have to thank the church here. You sent a generous check. And I was struggling with trying to figure out what to do. There are at least two other people in the room here that sent me some money. And at last minute, the Holy Spirit said they probably wouldn't want you to say anything about it. But I have to thank the church because, uh, you know, you sent me a check, and I appreciate that. But God, God took care of me, and I appreciate it. But I was, I was, I got a Honda Pilot out there, 2019, with um, uh, 2,800 miles on it. It's crazy. And the last new car I had was a 1975 Toyota Corona. Uh, literally, that's the last new car that I had. And uh, then I got called into, called to preach. And so it was downhill ever since then. And uh, the Lord said, if you're, if you're d crazy enough to, uh, you're crazy enough to uh, want to drive the rest of your ministry. I get invited to fly all the time, but I got to haul all those crazy books around. So it's too hard to f do that and ship books and ship them back. So I'm driving. So the Lord said, okay, if you're intent on doing that, I'll make it comfortable for you to the rapture. And I, that's what I think God did. Because I, listen, you think I'm a worldly dude just because I have a $34,000 car sitting out there that's paid off in two weeks? You see this suit? Isn't that a good looking suit? Tell me the truth, be honest. That's a nice looking suit. You know that school shooting you just had in California? Two days ago I was preaching there uh, three weeks ago in that same town. I bought this suit in that town. Hello neighbor. $19.95 at a Goodwill store. And I got a blue one better looking than this one. I bought, I bought two suits for under $40. I'm not a worldly person. You see that tie? That is a bad looking tie, isn't it? <laughs> First time I've ever worn it. I bought this yesterday. $1.95 at an Amvets in Murrillville, Tennessee. Listen, I used to work on Park Avenue. I wasn't always a geek. But I don't live for things. Heard a black preacher say the other day, he never saw a hearse pulling a U-hole, amen. Turn to Revelation chapter three. Revelation three. So maybe the Lord is keeping the devil at bay somewhat. I almost got killed two days ago in Chattanooga on uh, Interstate 24. I was on a third left lane, center lane, right lane, right? S a truck in the center lane, I'm in the left lane. Just starts weaving into my lane, pushing right into my lane. I lean on the horn, not tapped it, banged it, leaned on it, and it just kept coming over. Next thing I know, I'm on the shoulder right next to a barrier. You know, counting my, praying my beads, and he's just going right along in the third lane. All right, maybe the devil's messing with us tonight. Revelation chapter number three. Why don't we stand for the reading of God's word? Revelation three, verse number seven. We'll read down through verse 13. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works, Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. That's a beautiful verse. I believe that verse right there jumps from the Philadelphia age into the, Laod into the Philadelphia remnant in the end of the Laodicean age. Isn't that beautiful? It's going to keep somebody from the hour of temptation. And he's addressing the Philadelphia church in this, at the moment. Which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. 
Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Brother Jim, you got a prayer with you? Open up with prayer for you. Dear Jesus Christ in heaven, I pray be blessed, Brother Craig, to preach the word that we need in our hearts. Our words in Jesus Christ's name. In the holy and precious name, your name. Thank you. you. May be seated. Two of the seven verses in John's letter to the Philadelphia church deal with keeping the word. Verses 8 and verse 10, we just read them. Apostle John related to that truth because in Revelation 1.9 he says he was exiled for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. You know, the uh, second century, what, we, what we've come to hear called church fathers, and they really meant like Paul was a father to Timothy, spiritually speaking. They were the leaders of the early churches, second century. Things weren't very, very corrupt at that early stage. But he's the man that made the statement, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. You've heard that before. He wrote in one of his books called A Prescription of Heretics that the Apostle John was boiled in oil in the Colosseum under the order of the Emperor Domitian. And uh, I, was, <laughs> I heard a camp meeting preacher uh, this, we this past week who was big on quoting the Greek every time he turned around, and he thought he had a cute sermon idea when he talked about John writing the book of Revelation, right? You know, with third degree burns all over his body. I mean, he had a good imagination to come up with that. The only problem is a man that lived in the second century said that when John was boiled in the, in the Colosseum, he didn't have one bit of damage to his body. It was the biggest miracle. Almost the entire crowd professed Christianity after that miracle that they witnessed, and that's why the emperor had to send him to Patmos. Thus, during the seventh and final church age of Laodicea, Philadelphia-minded remnant in our time now, are defined by those who have kept the AV 1611. As this thing winds down, the Philadelphia remnant in this closing Laodicean age that are still keeping the word like they did predominantly during the Philadelphia age, we're just a little old remnant, and what are we doing? We're keeping the AV 1611. And as Brother Saluter pointed out, the core group of this remnant has come to be known as Ruckmanites after the leader, Peter Ruckman. And as he pointed out, that's t totally normal from church history. The Waldensians, the followers of Peter Waldo, even though the Waldensians were in that valley for over a thousand years, 1,500 years in that valley, but their most pre predominant phase of history w w was when they uh, were following a man by the name of Peter Waldo. But that's, you know, that's the way it always was. Uh, the Lutherans followed Luther. You know, that's how it always has been. And Ruckmanites, that's just totally normal par for the course. Now let me show you something. Turn to Exodus 26. I think it was apropos that a uh, hardcore Ruckman church uh, that I preach in periodically down in Amarillo, Texas, Charity Baptist Church. You know, most of you know Caleb Hickam. Uh, this is his church and his father is Larry Hickam and he's a uh, kind of pastor emeritus. Now he's passed the church down to his other, other son. But uh, I was in that church last year and man, one of the church members, not even a preacher, and there's no clergy lady, you know, in a Baptist church, but this just simple mind, simple church guy, maybe he's a truck driver, I forget what he did, he got up and gave a 10, 12 minute devotional. And man, he blew me into next week, Brother Gunther. He said, uh, look at verse number 12 of, Re of Exodus 26. This is just a little nugget out of the King James 1611, uh, English text, the little nugget, it's got nothing to do with the Greek. Uh, verse 12, and the remnant that remaineth of the curtains of the tent, the half curtain that remaineth shall hang over the backside of the tabernacle. You all see that? 
Young guys, see that word remnant? That's the first time the word remnant shows up in the Bible. Law first mentioned. And that church guy just pointed out, he said, the first time that the word remnant is used in the Bible, it's talking about the, the leftover pieces of the curtain, the remnant cloth from the, from the tabernacle. It was placed on the back end of the tabernacle. And that church member, no preacher, you know what he said? He said, it's kind of funny how God set the pace the first time that word shows up in the Bible, that God's remnant always has his back. Amen. Always has his back. It's got nothing to do with the Greek. You don't even need to know a lexicon. I don't know how your granny got, got, got by and didn't know the difference between a lexicon and the Lexus. Amen. <laughs> but keeping the word was not their only trait in the Philadelphia church age. It was instead the means to an end. What's the name of the church? Philadelphia. Who doesn't know what Philadelphia means? It means brotherly love. A strange doctrine to the average Ruckmanite. Who said that? Who said that? I don't know who said that. Somebody said that. If you repeat that, I'll deny it. August the 11th, 1612, a preacher in England by the name of Edward Whiteman was burned alive in London under the auspices and authority of King James. That's one year after the King James Bible came out. And that showed us that the body of Christ had the right Bible, but it was denied the freedom to believe and preach it and spread it. Thus, God had to open a door in that Philadelphia age and it was opened in 1776 in America, where the body of Christ for the first time in the church age was given unlimited freedom to spread that book that's on your lap. And isn't it an interesting coinky dinky that the paperwork was signed in a place called Philadelphia? Twelve letters, the number of Israel. If you're a homeschooler, that's the Bill of Rights. No, just kidding. That's why the current Prime Minister of Israel graduated from high school in Philadelphia, Benjamin Netanyahu. And a funny quinky dinky he graduated in 1967 in June, and I was just finishing my freshman year at, Catholic, at a Catholic high school 32 miles away. He, he had to run out of his graduation ceremony, he had to skip it and jump on a plane and get back to Israel to catch up with his unit for the Six Day War. And the war was over so fast, he never got engaged in any battles. He fought in the Yom Kippur War later after graduating from MIT. But they say that to this day, Netanyahu, nicknamed Bibi, speaks English with a perfect Philadelphia accent. And he's got a little Liberty Bell on his desk. Quinky dinky. Somebody said a coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. 1881, the first major challenge to the King James Bible. Most of you know that, the revised version. 1901, America's version of the English product came out. They had American scholars working with the English scholars from 1871 to 1881 in England. They would send their questions to the American committee, headquartered or chaired by a liberal theologian by the name of Philip Schaff, former uh, head of the Union Theological Seminary in New York. And uh, for 10 years, the American scholars gave their opinions on questions the English scholars had. And then uh, after the uh, uh, English product came out in 1881, it was agreed to, you know, for the sake of making money, you know, they had to wait 20 years before the Americans could put their version out. And uh, that's what the ASV is, the American Standard Version. Now, I don't want to be ugly, that's a North Carolina expression, but every toilet in America says American Standard on it. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> that's just a coincidence. I don't know why that is. It's just the truth. What's wrong with preaching the truth? Amen. Now, Philadelphia means brotherly love. Laodicea means, and most of you know by now, it means rights of the people. I put this in my book on Israel in the introduction. Most of you have that book from before. It's interesting that the church of Laodicea, it's called, the, the letter is written to the, to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, where the angel of the church in Philadelphia. 
You see a big difference? And all the other churches, starting with Smyrna, are, are worded the same way. Unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, unto the angel of the church in Pergamos. Just like that. You've seen that. I'm sure I've shared it before. And right on through to Philadelphia. And unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia. But then you get to Laodicea. It's, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. When you get to the end of the age, that church is owned, controlled by the people themselves, the apostate Christians in the last days that are in the majority. The Philadelphia age, you've seen the illustration how it works. The Lord is on the inside. He opens up the door and he sends the church out. That's what he just quoted the verse in his message, right? I open and no man shut and I shut and no man opens. I set before you an open door. That was the Philadelphia age when God's people went out there with hearts of brotherly love to get the word of God, keeping that word, the copy you got in your head, out spreading all around the world. And everything you've ever heard that's spectacular in church history happened during that big Philadelphia age. You all know that. I'm preaching to the choir here. But watch this neighbor. You get to, Laodice to the church of the Laodiceans. It's like this. Can I come in? Can I come in? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in. Philadelphia, he says he comes and goes when he wants to come and go. But when he gets to the Laodicean door, he can't come in unless he's let in. Why is that? Well, you have to have a key to get into a door and when it's locked, right? He has the key of David. It says that in the Philadelphia letter. Well, what happens when a wife or a girlfriend doesn't want her husband or boyfriend coming into the house anymore? What does she do? She changes the locks. Even B.B. King knew that. He had a song called, Somebody Changed the, 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 the Woman Changed the Locks and My Key Don't Work No More is the title of his song. <laughs> you understand the Lord couldn't, the Lord is not a Calvinist, otherwise he'd break the door down. He has to be let in by the time of Laodicea because the locks have been changed. The backslidden bride has locked the Lord out. That's how messed up things are in the last days. The major difference between Philadelphia and Laodicea. There's a major difference. The first seven books of the Bible parallel the seven church ages listed there in Revelation 2 and 3. You got Ephesus paralleling uh, Genesis, the book of beginnings, the, uh, the, the, uh, the first church age, first century. And then you got Exodus and Smyrna paralleling each other. Exodus, the, uh, Jew, the God's people are under the thumb, under the bondage of Pharaoh in Smyrna. The Christians are under the bondage and being persecuted by the Roman emperor, the Caesars. You get to Pergamos and Leviticus, they parallel just like that. Both of them re dealing with a church state situation. Pergamos meaning marriage and elevation. That's when Constantine marries the church to the state. Most of you know this stuff. And Leviticus, of course, is Israel's statehood as a religious state. And then Thyatira and Numbers parallel perfectly, apostasy in the wilderness. And uh, the great Th the Thyatira, the great uh, dark age period when the church is plunged into the, the, the Satan's millennium and they prefer the uh, Pope's toe to a nail-scarred foot, and therefore they just got wiped out. Go read a book called A World Lit Only by Fire by William Manchester. They'll tell you the average person in the Dark Ages never traveled more than 25 miles from the place he was born. I mean, Dark Ages, eight, you know, uh, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. It was a disaster, a thousand years of darkness. Then you get Joshua and Philadelphia. What a parallel there, conquest. Spiritual, you see that? Spiritual conquest, and then you come down to what? Laodicea and Judges. Perfect hand in a glove, those seven books paralleling the seven eras of church history in Revelation. Now, what's that got to do with anything? Joshua, it's a singular authority. What happens when you get into the period of Judges? Turn to Judges 21 real quick. Judges 21. When you get to, in Joshua, you have singular authority, King James Bible. When you get to the period of the judges, you have fragmentation, multiplied authorities. What's it say there? The last verse of the, uh, the book of Judges. This will explain it. The last book. You got 13 judges, by the way. Number 13 is Samson. And he had his eyes put out, didn't he? 
Verse 25, in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own what? The last word in that seventh book of the Bible is the word eyes. Turn to Revelation 3. Here comes your cross reference. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse 16. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. This is the character of the age that we're living in tonight. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and what? Blind and naked. When you get into Laodicean age, it's going to parallel the book of Judges, and it's going to be multiplied authorities. No, no king in the land. Every man's doing that which is right in his own eyes. Laodicean Christians are blind and fragmented as a rule. And the great nugget is that there are still some Philadelphia Bible-believing remnant people left at the end of that Laodicean age. What do you think, who do you think you are? Why are so many Christians in America looking, like, looking at you like you're crazy? How many megachurches do you know that believe the King James, King James only megachurches? Brother Sal is closest thing to that, and he's in the shadow of a mosque down there. Here's your nugget. Here's your beautiful nugget. You look at a harvest, you look at a harvest, you have the first fruits, and then the main harvest and the gleanings, right? In those seven churches, you've got from Ephesus up to Sardis, you have the first fruits. When you get to the age of Philadelphia, that's the great main harvest in church history. And then you get into Laodicea, where we're living tonight, and where are we? We're in the gleanings. So here's the nugget. Look how beautiful this is. You got those seven books of the Bible? Judges parallels Laodicea, right? What's the book tucked, tucked right behind Judges that falls in the very historical time frame? What's that book? Book of Ruth. What a coinky dinky. You see, in Judges, that pictures what the standard Christianity is passed off for tonight. Preachers with zipper problems, Samson. You got uh, woman, women preachers, even a Gail Ripplinger has to write a book because so many of the so-called scholars have no interest in defending the King James Bible. You had Deborah as a judge. You got Micah, the guy that, that's got his own, uh, he's a preacher for hire. You got all kinds of crazy stuff. The guy cutting a woman up in all those pieces. And you've got all this stuff going on in the book of Judges. That's a picture. You got jealous preachers, remember there? They're going to over Gideon situation. They're going to go to war because you didn't help us fight the bad guys. You got just crazy stuff. You can look at the Schofield Reference Bible, oh, chapter by chapter by chapter by chapter. The only heading the Schofield Board could come up with was two, were two words, religious confusion, religious confusion. All through the Schofield Reference Bible and the latter chapters of Judges. It's a crazy time. But then if you want to find out what you're supposed to be all about, you read the book of Ruth. That's the picture of the Philadelphia remnant. Whithersoever thou goest, I'll go. Amen. And you take that gleaning, you take what God gives you. I remember a preacher preached a sermon on Acts 27, some old timer from Alabama. He talked about the end of the church age in Acts 27. He said, how do you know you get your old ship of Zion? How do you know when you're getting close to the end of the age? He said, everybody's throwing everything overboard. Keep the boat fly, uh, floating. And then the closer you get to the shore, the more shallow the water's going to get. I've shared these nuggets over the years, but who knows who's listening now through the internet and who might be visiting the, this evening. What a great truth. This preacher just brought this stuff out. It was a wildest sermon I ever heard. The closer you get to the shore, the more shallow the water's getting. 14 fathoms, 10 fathoms. You old timers know how shallow things are today compared to when you were a kid. And then he said, the more shallow the water, uh, number three, the worse the fishing is. Jesus said, launch out into the deep if you want to get a draw. How's your soul winning results today compared to the 1970s? Don't get depressed about it. You're in shallow water. I preached that sermon up in a K 
King James Bible Believers Church in Montreal, Canada a few years ago, and this tall French Canadian came up to me, about six foot six, little mustache, you know, little painter's hat on it. That's how I remember. He, he probably didn't look like that way, but he was, def he was definitely French, man. And he, he probably weighed about 80 pounds. He said, Dr. Grady, I, this is what I do remember. Doc, I make up a lot of stuff, by the way, as I go along. But when I write my books, it's all accurate, footnoted. But when I'm preaching, I get, I get off on a lot of fantasy things. <laughs> It's the voices in my head. I can't tell wh wh when's the Lord. And wh wh anyway, he said, Dr. Grady, he said, Dr. Grady, I appreciated your sermon on Acts chapter 27. But I must tell you, we should never forget the minnows. That's what you're dealing with in the 21st century most of the time, minnows. Those are your soul winning prospects. The folks do the pray with you. And you go back to follow up on them, they hide behind the closed curtains. The ones you prayed with, you know, and like Sammy Allen used to say, watch out for those sinners that pray and ask Jesus to save them on Saturday and the FBI can't find them on Monday. <laughs> You're getting close to the end. And by the way, Brother Gunther and these p good pastors that are here in the service tonight, you know what they're basically doing with their congregations? If you want to know what Brother Gunther's trying to do with all of you, you know, he's trying to help you keep your head above water as we get, get to the end. The ships have busted up already. And we're floating to the coastline on pieces of the ship, busted up boards and so forth. Now let me pivot. All that to say this. Here's the main thrust of the message. Dr. Peter Ruckman, one of the greatest spiritual heroes I've ever had, was absolutely, was the uncontested champion of what has come to be known as the KJV only camp. But now he is gone, and we all miss him for sure. And as that classic scene in The Godfather 1, where Salazzo tells Tom Hayden, and now the Godfather's dead, bless his soul, and there's nothing that can bring him back. Yeah. I got a nice text from Brother Peacock two days ago. He said, quote, I just want you to know I appreciate you and what you are doing since the old preacher is gone, end of quote. And I sent back an answer to him, thanks, pastor. If it wasn't for that old preacher, I wouldn't be doing anything like I am doing at the present, end of quote. Bob Jones Sr. used to say, when gratitude dies on the altar of a man's heart, that man is nigh well useless. You know what I did on the way up here? An eight-hour drive uh, uh, today. I was, in I was in Louisiana last Sunday morning. I, I, was in, I was in Mississippi for Buddy Blunkle's funeral. Uh, I mean, in, in Arkansas first. Then I drove down to Louisiana, Monroe, Louisiana, preached there. And then I drove over someplace else. Uh, I, I've been all over the place. Can't keep track of it anymore. But on the way here today, eight-hour drive, I stopped at one of the most sacred places I stop at, and I stop at it regularly, on I-75, right short of south of Dayton, in a, in a, in a Lebanon, Ohio exit. I think it's exit 60-something, I mean, Route 64, 60-something, but it's Lebanon, Ohio, you know? And I get off there, there's a McDonald's right there, and there's a Honda dealer, and right, right between the two of them, there's a, there's a kind of a crummy, broken-down-looking motel. It's only changed the name about 25 times over the years. But way back in 1992, I stayed at that motel, and Dr. Ruckman stayed, was in the room right next to me, and I was his chauffeur from uh, uh, Brother Eric Brazelton's church, Miltonville, ba Miltonville Baptist Church, and it was having a King James conference, and I was gonna speak just one time, but Dr. Ruckman was the, was the main speaker for the several days, and I was dubbed his uh, chauffeur. What a blessed time it was for me to be with him. And I remember one night, I, got, I was watching you know, some stupid movie or something. About 12 o'clock, I said, I better get midnight, I better get ready for my message tomorrow morning. I wasn't spiritual then. I mean, that's a long time ago. And so I went out of my room, it was an outdoor entrance, no indoor entrance, it was outdoor entrance. And I went to my car, lifted up the hood, I probably told this story here before. I lifted up the hood to get a couple of sermon outlines out of a box I had in the trunk, and all of a sudden I heard some noise, and I looked to my right, and I could hear something, but I couldn't see it, so I assumed the position, amen? And I, I just heard something in the dark, 
And next thing I know, I could see, here comes Dr. Ruckman running, skipping rope, barefoot on the pavement out there in the parking lot and just running by, you know, coming right past me. And I looked at him. He didn't know I was out there at 1230 in the morning. And as he goes by, I look at him. He looks at me. He never stopped. He didn't say, hey, Brother Green, how you doing? Let's fellowship. He just kept on going. And all he said as he went by, is, he said, I got to burn off them calories. Amen, brother. Got to burn off them calories. He said it twice. Who was that masked man? And then, you know, here's the motel running this way here and there's a little dinky parking lot and there's a big grassy knoll up here, a, a big elevated area. And way up here, on the top of that hill, there used to be a Perkins restaurant there. And uh, all week we ate breakfast there together, him and his crispy bacon, amen. And he, was, and he was teaching me so much Bible on the napkins, always with a napkin, with a felt tip pen. Precious memories, how they linger. You know, you'll never realize how often I go there. I did it today pull up to the very spot just about where my car was, get out of the car and lean up against it and remember that day. Never forgot it. I get on my treadmill about 30 minutes every day I'm home, any, any day I'm in a motel. I'm trying to stay healthy. I've had a heart attack. I've got type 2 diabetes. I've got a lot of health issues come up out of nowhere. All of it, all of it came up when I was writing that book on Israel. No big deal. You do anything right, the devil's going to mess with you. But I still work at trying to stay healthy because of him. But I, 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 I cherish the memories I had. I mean, I've preached for him four different times and four blowouts. I've preached with him. I've been in his home ten times. I've made, I've made visits with him when he visited his own church members. For over 20 years... I was always on the alert for ways to show the doc how I felt about him. I learned that from Jack Howes. He was very personalized like that about doing things for people. When Dr. Ruckman turned 80 years old, what a milestone. And I wanted to do something special for him. And I just thought I got to try to encourage him. And I had a, I had a man in, not, in uh, Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, that was a woodworking engineer, a brilliant guy. And he made Dr. Ruckman, at my request, a staff, because Moses got a staff got commissioned when he's 80 and he got the gnarliest wood you could find right and it from like from the ground all the way up to here crooked messed up I mean real rough looking thing like you'd think a staff would be but when he got to the very top of it I had him fashion a perfectly smooth hockey stick top and come out like that I mean perfect Looked just like any hockey stick anybody would use and had Ruckman carved into it with the number 80 on one side for his age and on the other side his life's verse about playing the man, shipped that thing down to him, blew his mind. Something I wanted to do to encourage the old man. He's just getting started now at 80. That's how Moses didn't start till he was 80. Then by the time he turned 90, I said, man, how am I going to beat what I did when, when for his 80th? And I couldn't come up with anything. Then I heard somebody told me at the last, I was going to go down for his 90th birthday party. Then I found out, I mean, I'm flying down there Saturday uh, for the party. And Thursday, I still didn't know what I was going to give him. I was frustrated. I was going to get him some German bread up here in this crazy place, this Christmas joint up here. What's the name of this place? Who? Frankenmuth, I was going to buy him some German, Russian bread. You know, that's all. And I was depressed because I'm an artist, amen. And I like to think flaky thoughts, and I didn't have any flaky thought yet. I figured that bread is stupid. And at the, and at the le hey, you, hey, by the way, if you want something crazy for somebody, you want to do something really wild for somebody for a Christmas idea, no kidding. I was preaching in for Doug Duffin at Fairbanks, Alaska last year. There's a place, North Pole, Alaska. You can buy one square inch of North Pole, Alaska, and get a deed. Literally, you can know somebody's a Christmas nut. You buy them a, a square inch of North Pole, they'll send it to a, They'll give them a title deed. It's legal. It only costs about $30. You owe me for that idea. That's a, that is a bad idea. And so long story short, for his 90th birthday, at the last minute, some Thursday, I learned that he's swimming at the, uh, at the Pensacola Junior College swimming pool for exercise. You go in there two, three days a week, you know, trying to stay in shape. And, and you know what I found? I did some jumping around on the internet, and I was able to buy Dr. Ruckman for his 90th birthday a, a one-piece bathing suit 
that the men wore in the old days, you know, with the straps over the shoulder. It was literally, the tag, it was 1921 on the tag. I got it at a, at a uh, not a thrift store, a, what do you call those places? It, was, it, it, wasn't an, uh, it wasn't a replica, it was a real bathing suit, you know, that somebody had you know, owned, and the, the tag was in there, the, it, was, it was from a store in New York, 100% wool, navy blue. And, uh, and I got that thing, and I had a, a, a Muslim at the mall there, right here in Flint. I was in, that's when I was pastoring up here in Swartz Creek. And, 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 and that mall right in that nearby in Swartz Creek had this Muslim shop. I had him put uh, on, on the shirt across the top, Ruckman in a half moon like that, letters, and the bottom half of the circle going that way, Rehoboth. Uh, that's the that's the beach where he was the lifeguard, you know. And there went 90, 90 in the middle. So you know, Ruckman, Rehoboth for Rehoboth Beach, and then the 90. And I'm, I mean, I'm running home. I'm picking it up at the at the mall Thursday night. About maybe this was Friday. Now that's right. I ordered it Thursday. I didn't get it till Friday. And I'm now I'm, I rush it into the mall. They're working on all this crazy stuff at the last minute. It's Friday night. I've got a flight Saturday morning down to Pensacola. So I'm racing home. And all of a sudden, going by my little church in Swartz Creek, the Holy Spirit said, "Now don't you have a, a book in your library in that office, uh, Mafia Encyclopedia? And isn't there a picture of Al Capone standing?" in by a swimming pool with a cigar in his mouth wearing the identical colored, identical style shirt? You know, you don't realize how cool the Lord is. He may not do this with you, but you know, he knows I'm a lost cause and a lot of this stuff. It ain't going to hurt me one bit. And I'm t either the devil told me to do that or the Lord did. And I, you turned the room right back into my church office, found that book, and I had my wife photocopy that page and I put it in the box. And I said, Dear Dr. Ruckman, this belonged to somebody. And you know, Big Al used to be at the Five Points Gang in New York before he went to Chicago. This might have been his shirt, his bathing suit. Put that in the box brought it down, gave it to one of his kids to give it to him at his party. I didn't grandstand here, Dr. Ruck, but look what I got for you. I had his kid give it to him. Stayed overnight, Sunday morning, went to church Sunday night. I'm sitting there with Brother Ford, the bookstore guy in the pew, and I said to Brother Ford, I said, uh, told him what I did. He thought it was a crazy idea, and he said, you know what? Brother Bill, I think Dr. Ruckman's got your bathing suit right now. I was, two, I was sitting two rows behind him at Bible Baptist Church, and I looked, and sure enough, he had his arm around his wife, and he had a cloth in his hand, and he had the crazy bathing suit in his hand. And Brother Donovan was getting ready to preach the Sunday night service. The party was Saturday, and I'm going home Monday. And right before Brother Donovan started the sermon, Ruckman runs up there behind the pulpit, and he says, uh, hey, like, he knows me since 1988, and he still can't keep my name straight, you know what I mean? He said, is brother, brother Brady still here? Brother Brady still here, you know? And I, I brother Grady's here, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and he picked up the shirt, you know, the bathing suit, I keep calling the shirt, picked the bathing suit up and showed it to everybody. He said, only brother Grady could be crazy enough, you know, to come up with something. He loved that thing, but let me show you how cool the Lord is again. Again, if you live a fun life and an exciting life and stay close to God and let him take you through a journey, you'll have a lot of crazy things happen. On Monday, I went to the bookstore to deliver a case of books that they had ordered and I hand delivered them. And on the counter by the cash register in the bookstore, they had these mugs piled up, coffee mugs that were made to commemorate Dr. Ruckman's 90th birthday. And when you have that mug here, look, on this side of the mug is a picture of him dressed up real nice, the way he looks tonight, 90 years old, right? Look, turn the coffee mug that way, backwards, and on the back side is a picture of Dr. Ruckman, how you like this? Five years old, right? <laughs> Standing at Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, with the ocean behind him. Ruckman, Rehoboth, 90. Happy birthday, Dr. Ruckman. That's the stuff God does. Now here's the main thrust of my message. Here's the main thrust of my message. I believe we need to honor Dr. Ruckman's legacy. He's gone. We need to honor his legacy, not just this group now. I mean King James Bible-believing people all across America who have been affected by Dr. Ruckman for good. We need to honor his legacy as we glean in the fields and if Brother Reese is right, we only have to wait till Trump's second term. 
That's why Trump's, that's why Jesus is coming at the last Trump. <laughs> Brother Reese, am I right? Did you quote 2020? Where you at? That's right, ain't it? 2022? We hope so, brother. He said it. I'm just quoting him, brother. How are we going to honor Dr. Ruckman's legacy between now and the end? There's several ways we can do it. Number one, we need to discern the spirit of the age. Job 24.1 asks, Why, seeing times are not hidden from the Almighty, do they that know him not see his days? Ruckmanites, like anyone else in this age, will tend to fragmentation. Was there anybody better illustrating Joshua and the single authority of this book than Dr. Ruckman? He's Joshua, and he's gone. Now there's going to be fragmentation among the Bible believers. Same thing's going on in the Hiles group, but Dr. Hiles gone. All these different Hiles people for a long time fighting out who's going to be the, you know, the cock of the roost or whatever their farm expression is, who's going to be the cock of the, of the walk, who's going to run everything. A lot of scrambling around, a lot of fragmentation. That's where I come out of. I know about that stuff. Now listen to this. The Ruckmanites, in Dr. Ruckman's absence, are divided, can be divided into two main schools of thought. Now I'm warning you, this is going to hair lip somebody. That's the idea behind it. You get hair lipped and then you can recover and, and, and get better and get right with the Lord. I don't mean most of you. I know this church. You folks, I'm talking about internet land. The space cadets out there in, in the cyberspace. Ready? Two groups. Number one, those who love Doc more than they love the book he promoted. Amen. And number two, those who, those who love him enough to follow in his steps, regardless of where they might lead. I wrote down here tricky. I want you to know it's tricky. But I just said. I, I watched two, two of Dr. Ruckman's, uh, or listened to two of his messages today driving up here. And one of them, he went on and on and on how deceitful this book is. You've heard him go into that. That book will trip you up all over the place if you're not looking for the truth. It's meant to blow you up into, like with landmines all through. You ever hear him talk about that? I just heard him spend 10 minutes talking about that. What I just told you was something tricky. Let me read it again. Those who love Doc more than the book he promoted, and those who love him enough to follow in his steps, regardless of where they lead. You won't have any problem understanding what I meant by that statement in just a couple of seconds here. Let me explain. Let me testify for about what I'm getting ready to say. I have earned the right, the guy that you're listening to right now, who's as imperfect as anybody else who's ever been on the earth, imperfect as I am, I have earned the right, listen now, to critically examine the current status of this movement known as Ruckmanism in Dr. Ruckman's absence. I have earned the right to examine it critically, under a microscope, I've earned the right to do that for two reasons. Number one, I, in the will of God, God did this, I was the human tool he used, I forged the bridge between the Hiles camp and the King James positions of the Ruckman camp. I did it. I don't, you know me, most of you know me real well. I'm just being dramatic up here, drama queen, keep your attention. It's not that I, you wanna know how cool I am? Go look at my Honda out there if you wanna know I'm cool. <laughs> Man, it's cool. Yeah. It is cool, isn't it, Brother Sluter? You've been there. My $19.95 suit is cool too. <laughs> hey, I was the teacher at Howes Anderson when I came there in 1986 from my church in Idaho for five years. I've told you the story before. And Jack Howes had switched to the King James Bible in 1984 because of Dr. Ruckman's material. So told to me from, by Mark Rasmussen, who taught at the college, his father, Roland Rasmussen, 
pastored that large church in Canoga Park, California, and Roland Rasmussen was a Bob Jones graduate who got swung over like Brother Noe did to the King James position. He got, got flaky with a mid-trib rapture toward the end of his life, but he was very strong in the King James forever. And Mark, his son, who I taught with, told me, his dad told him, that he had sent Dr. Howe tons of Ruckman's material, and finally Dr. Dr. Howe switched over. I don't think for five minutes Dr. Howe understood any of it. But he had confidence in Roland Rasmussen, and that's when he preached his big sermon in April of 1984, Logic Must Prove the King James Bible, and it came out of the closet for the King James. I'm in Idaho, teach pastoring out there when that happened. At 81 to 86, 84, Dr. Howes goes off the deep end for good. When I left, when I graduated and went off to Idaho, nobody was King James at the school. They criticized in the classroom. I never even heard of a King James position, never heard of Rockman. So I come back to teach. Welcome back, Carter. Amen. I was invited to come back there to teach in my alma mater. And I got there in 86, and everybody's running around, King James, King James. And nobody knew why. I couldn't get a straight answer out of anybody. My own son-in-law was a freshman, and the crazy teacher he had, Larry Smith, said in the classroom, we use the King James Bible because Jack Howells told us to. And if he told us to switch tomorrow, we'd switch tomorrow. My son-in-law asked him about that after the class, and he blew him off. He thought he misheard. He called his mama that night, and she picked him up the next morning. He's gone. He's married to my daughter tonight. Wonderful man. He, got, he chased himself out of that because the place was a Looney Tune place. Everybody was King James, but only because Jack Howe said so. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I ran into when I came back to start teaching in 86. I was mad. I was getting up and preaching chapel, make fun of the King James issue. In front of 2,000 people and all that, they were looking at me like, what's, more, what's the matter with him? Give me some information, I said. And that's when Brother Patterson gave me Jack, Howe, Jack Peter Ruckman's tapes on the King James Bible and opened my eyes. The craziest thing is the guy that gave him the tapes was the road manager for the Almond Brothers rock band. True story, his name was Monday. He got, he got saved and went to PBI. <laughs> hey, my wife gave me a King James Bible. She got at a uh, Beach Boys concert three months before we got married. I told you that story. She came out of the Beach Boys concert, saw a book table there at the Harrington County Fair is where it was, and saw a book table and said, I'll get a King James Bible for my husband for his wedding present. So I got my King James Bible from the Beach Boys, and I got my King James position from the Almond Brothers. How do you like that? <laughs> and I was saved in Clarence Larkin's home church and grounded on premillennial dispensationalism at Philadelphia College of the Bible, co-founded by C.I. Schofield. How could you make up all that stuff? Now. And so when I got my eyes open, man, I just was running wild. And, all I, and I started a course on the King James Bible, began to read everything I could find. That was in 1988 is when my eyes fl flew open. And then I wrote this book in 1992, uh, 12 months, it came out in 93, on the King James Bible. And God used my material to get the fundamental people uh, 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 aware of do Dr. Ruckman, you know, you know the story. I've shared it before. He said, Brother Bill, uh, if you're going to write this book, I wouldn't quote, m quote my material in there because they, you know, they'll, they'll get hair lifted. They see my name. So we kept his name out of the book on purpose. And that's when I put that Ruckman lion from his Revelation commentary on the spine as a joke for Ruckmanites. We slipped Dr. Ruckman in and none of the fundamentalists knew what that lion meant, but all the Ruckmanites thought it was funny and I kept Dr. Ruckman's name and didn't quote any of his material, kept it out, but I put his lion on the spine. And next thing you know, brother, I mean, people were learning the issue. I sold the first 5,000 copies of that book in about 50 days and another 5,000 went out in a couple months. I don't know how many thousands and thousands. I had a UPS truck coming to my house five days a week, five days a week to pick up the orders from the night before. And the orders were always standing out on my porch, stacked up cases, uh, uh, six and seven and eight and 10 cases per day, five days a week. I paid the price by forging the bridge to the house camp. And number two, I paid the price because of my association with Dr. Ruckman because after a while people started finding out that I was preaching down there for him and, and my meetings started getting canceled like crazy. And you know that. That's the what would happen. And I lost a lot of open doors. And like he's talking about, these compromisers like Doug Stauffer, that's who he's talking about. He's a southerner. He don't want to be ugly. But these people that 
change their position because the, the non-King James group is bigger and they think there's more money in there. I can survive on $19.95 suits because I got a God that can give me a $34,000 vehicle in 15 days. You learn that if you've been at this for 40 something years. I wrote the forward to Brother Kim's book, Gene Kim's book, Ruckmanism Ruckus. And that was, I was out of the, out of the closet by that time. There was no way to hide, hide my identity anymore as Dr. Ruckman wanted me to. The good was already done that was gonna be done. And when I wrote that book, one of the things I said in the forward to his book, I said, you know, I said, if the rapture took place tonight and we fly up to heaven and the announcement's made that the judgment seat's gonna be out, was gonna be in a week, I'd hang out with Dr. Ruckman in public up there. That's what I put in print because I know what kind of rewards he's gonna be getting and I'm not, I, I don't have any problem going out on a limb about that. Now here's one of the weirdest things. Here's something really weird. You would be shocked at how many snubbings I get from Ruckmanite pastors. Yeah. Brother Sluter, is that right? You know that. You know why that? So why would that be, Brother Grady? For the same reason that non-Hiles Anderson College preachers like people like Jack Treber, that Jack Howes would use at pastor school, different, even Brother Will here in Michigan used to preach for the pastor school, and, and our best graduates at the time, guys like Keith Gomez, that I'm you know friends with to this day, but our core Howes guys were real irritated when Jack Howes would use people that did not go to our school, and they kind of kept those guys at arm's length and criticized them behind their back. Yeah. And I'm so dumb, it took me a long time to realize that I was getting treated that way by a lot of Ruckman guys because Dr. Ruckman used me four times down at the blowout. Strange, isn't it? Did you ever, I don't know why I'm stuck on The Godfather tonight, but do you remember when, uh, when Tom Hayden was talking to Sonny? Yeah, you don't understand, you know, he's not your, he's not your father. And remember that scene and when he got shot and Tom says, I'm as much a son to him as you are, Sonny. I didn't graduate from Dr. Ruckman's school, but I was close enough to him to profit from everything he taught me that I look at him like a mentor like any graduate would look at him from PBI. Now, let's get down to the heavy stuff. How many of you know what it is to read, mu to play music by ear? How many of you know what sight reading is versus phonics? You all know what that stuff is? Do you know that, you understand what I just said? Sight readers don't know phonics. They memorize words. Okay, people who can't play, read music play by ear. And there's nothing wrong if that's what you do, but there's a difference between playing by ear and being able to read the music, yes? Now this is gonna hair lip a million people what I'm getting ready to say right here. Brother Sluter, I don't think I have enough courage to go forward with this. Why don't you take over? Come on. <laughs> I had many here, and I crossed many out, and I replaced it with the word most. Most Ruckmanites are, <laughs> how am I going to say this where it makes sense? Most Ruckmanites memorize Dr. Ruckman's positions. They don't study the Bible for themselves. And now their light's over because he's gone. All they have are his books. And they can't go any further than that. I didn't say many, I said most. I've been in this circle since 1988. I know something about what I'm speaking about. Hey, I was writing that book on Israel for six years, 18,000 hours. I called lots of Ruckman guys to get insights on prophetic questions. I didn't get one straight answer. I don't think if I got one straight answer. Now. With that in mind, let me tell you a very shocking statement here. Dr. Ruckman, the greatest guy the Lord had in the transition Philadelphia layout of C&H, the absolute greatest guy. That I, have, I haven't read another commentary by anybody in, in, four, in 30 years since 88, whatever it is when I first learned Dr. Ruckman's views. I have never read anybody else's material on the Bible. It's stupid compared to whatever I've gotten from him. 
That's just the way it's been. Not one. I haven't read anybody. But here's a shocking statement. The only person in this business, you know, the clergy business, that's infallible is the Pope. Yes, sir. Dr. Ruckman was not infallible. Would you like to know, I have 50,000 copies of that book, Final Authority, that's, that's been sold that I know of. Do you know I had two preachers, well-known preachers, that tried to talk me out of writing the book? One of them was Jack Howes, my own boss at the time. I was teaching for him. He tried to talk me out of writing that book when he found out I was trying to write it. You know who the other preacher was who tried to talk me out of writing the book? Take a guess. I'll give you a hint. Got to burn off them calories, amen? Got to burn off them calories. That's when I asked him, told him I was writing a book. He said, you don't need to write a book. There's enough stuff out there already. I can't hear you. I don't think Dr. Ruckman was right on that. But that's okay. Is he supposed to be infallible? Nobody's infallible. Now, Dr. Ruckman's dead. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that the Holy Spirit will no longer reveal truth in the AV 1611 now that Dr. Ruckman's gone? Is that the end? Are we limited to what's in his commentaries? James Melton pastors a church in Sharon, Tennessee. He's got, he's got about 12 people in the church at a storefront, a town of about 300, like Mayberry RFD, you know, granaries out there in the distance, a storefront church, glass windows, you know, an old... Old, old, old part of the town. It's, 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 it just doesn't look very impressive. But Brother Melton's a pretty good guy, and I don't agree with him on everything, and he don't agree with me, but he's a good guy for sure. And I went in there and I said, Brother, I preached for him the last time. I said, Brother Jim, the Lord show, show you anything new in the Bible lately? He said, well, Brother Grady, he didn't do that, but I always do this by now, and people you get laughs, so I'll hold your attention. He, he, said, uh, he said, well, Brother Grady, as a matter of fact, he did, and, he, and I said, what is it? And he showed me Genesis chapter 1, and he went down from verse 1 all the way to 12. Every one of those verses mentions God's name. In the beginning, God created, right? And God saw, and God said, right on down, I've shared this again here before. And you get down to verse 13, God's name is not mentioned in that verse. In verse 14, it shows up again and keeps going. The first time God disappears from the King James Bible, off the page disappears is the first time the number 13 shows up. Man, I ran back to Dr. Ruckman's material as fast as I could, Genesis commentary, numer uh, numerics booklet, anything I had. Guess what? He didn't say anything about that. I've never seen that. In he told me, Melton said the Lord showed it to him. That might have been true. He might not have been lying to me. God showed him that. Did God give the Apostle John any additional light after Paul was beheaded? Turn to Deuteronomy 7 real quick. Let me show you something. Blow your mind. Deuteronomy 7. I want to show you something uh, that has blown my mind lately. I read this in a book not long ago. <laughs> I read this in a book not long ago that was written in 1894. It's called After the Thousand Years by an author by the name of Trench, okay? Look at Deuteronomy 7, verse number 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments, right? How long is God going to fulfill his covenant to the, to the subject of verse 9? To a what? Thousand generations. You want to know what one of the spookiest subjects in the whole Bible is? It's, you just read it. Watch this now, skipping time, skipping other verses to save time. If you'll go to Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, if you're making notes, you don't have to turn to it, but that's the verse that tells you about establishing the veracity of a truth if it's given two or th by two or three witnesses. You know that scripture, right? I just showed you the first reference to a thousand generations there in Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. If you go, I mean, in Deuteronomy 7, verse 9. And if you go to 1 Chronicles 16, verse 19, and then Psalm 105, verse 8. 
First Chronicles 16, verse 19, and Psalm 105, verse 8. Those other two references say the exact same thing that Deuteronomy 7, 9 says. It says that God is going to confirm His covenant to His people to a thousand generations. You remember that expression, things that are different are not the same? You ever heard that? Do you know a thousand years is what the millennium is? Do you know a year and a generation are not the same thing? Dr. Ruckman spent all that time teaching us over the years, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven are not the same thing. God and heaven are two different things. Do you know a, ge a thousand generations and a thousand years are not the same thing? And all you've got to do is decide one thing, if that verse is talking about figurative truth or literal truth. That's all you've got to decide. Was God being figurative and didn't mean a thousand generations literally or did he mean literal? He says it three times for emphasis. And the rule of Bible interpretation is you go with a literal interpretation first and then figurative second. Unless you're forced. Uh, Jesus said, I am, the I am a door. He's not a wooden door. Obvious, that's figurative. But if it's not obvious, you go with a literal. Three times God told you He's going to confirm His covenant with the Jews for a thousand generations. Do you know Dr. Larkin and Dr. Ruckman disagreed on that verse? Larkin said, of a gen Larkin said it was literal. Brother Ruckman thought it was figurative. Larkin said, if you give a minimum of 33 years for a generation because of the perfect age of Christ, that means that after the new heavens and the new earth come down, and so-called eternity is supposed to begin. Every timeline shows eternity starting with the new heavens and the new earth and the new city. La, 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 kumbaya time. Now we're in eternity. The only problem is Revelation 22, 2 talks about 12 manner of fruit. It changes every month. I thought the basic difference between time and eternity is that in eternity there's no time. Time is still being marked in Revelation 22, and Larkin and all those old timers at the end of the Philadelphia church age believed that the dispensation of the fullness of times was that thousand generation period when there's no death, no Satan, no sin, nothing, and Jesus is ruling in an absolute perfect kingdom, nothing like the crazy millennium that we've had built up so many years in our brains as the glorious age, you know. It's so glorious that Jesus is whacking people on the head 24 seven, ruling with a rod of iron, throwing people into hell, shutting the rain off, according to Zechariah 14, if they don't come up to, the, to Jerusalem, and then at the end, wiping out more people than Carter's got pills. That's some beautiful kingdom. And 1 Corinthians 15 says at the end of some kingdom, he's going to get off his throne and give it to his father, and then go back into the Godhead, and that's the end of the Son of Man. He goes back in as the Word. So God is all in all. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 says. Well, Dr. Ruckman thought that happened at the end of the millennium. But Dr. Ruckman was so gracious. You know what he says in his commentary on 1 Corinthians? He says, he says, so what it looks like from, from these verses is before eternity begins, Jesus Christ the man ceases to exist and he goes back into the Godhead in his position as the Word of God. Now, I know this is hard to comprehend, but when has the Trinity ever been easy to understand? Here's what I want you to see. Now, Clarence Larkin has a different view. And you can read it in his commentary on Revelation and his book on dispensational truth both available at the Bible Baptist Bookstore. Here's the part I want you to see. And since Clarence Larkin is the source for all prophetic exposition among 20th and 20th, uh, the, uh, among premillennial fundamentalists and conservatives in the 20th and 21st century, I would be doing you a disservice if I did not try to describe his system to you. So briefly, here it is. And here he goes right on down here, and he goes into all that time, and I'm not going to take the time to read it to you, where he explains what I just told you, where he basically says Larkin believes that it was um, literal and not figurative like I believe. <laughs> I, I shared this with a pastor in New York State one, uh, six months ago, and two days later he gave me this. Could you help me, buddy? Just, this, is a, this is a chart from Clarence Larkin's book. Just hold it up high, okay? 
See, here, you see that black thing here? That's the, new, that's the renovation of the earth, the new heaven and the new earth. See it over there? And then over here on this side, it's called the perfect age. And here it is, the dispensation of the fullness of times and 33,000 years. Some, some authors thought it was 40,000 years. You know, a generation being 40 years. Some think, think it's 100 years. So it's another 100,000 years. But at the end of that period is when Jesus gets off his throne and gives a perfect kingdom to his father with no problems for all that period of time. And then he goes back into the Godhead. You know that preacher that gave this to me? He got this from Ruckman's bookstore. Thank you. Now, you ready, neighbor? You ever remember that song? That guy had two girlfriends. You get, now you have to finally decide which one you want. Can't have them both. So, guess what, neighbor? I, I think Larkin's right. See? Now I get, I'm going to get stoned. Look, Pastor. See? You know, what, you know what I was before I became a Ruckmanite? I was a Baptist. Soul liberty. Boy, it's getting quiet in here, isn't it? And you haven't heard the scary part yet. You said, don't you know what time it is? I promise you, I can take my phone, which I left in the van. Hey, Amen. I don't want to get embarrassed like Tony Duty's phone was going off a little while ago. I don't know if that was him, but I just pick him out. Um... I promise you, did I show it to you at the kitchen table? I was listening to, at, at the Jimmy John's at, when we were sitting there eating. I got a sermon from Ruckman I was watching today. It was two hours and 12 minutes long. Am I right? He's on the Middle East. That was the title of his sermon. I'm not preaching that long, but you know something? Once in a blue moon, you got to get excited about church as you do tailgating parties and long overtime games. And I can't stay here long enough. Though. I got to go home now. Let's have another barbecue. Because I've got something very scary to show you. I'm just testing the water and it's getting kind of quiet in here. I'm not a sight reader. I try to study the Bible best I can and see what God will show me. Let me tell you, neighbor, inspiration's going on when you're reading your Bible and understanding something you didn't understand before. I'm telling you, neighbor. You see, the crowd that's the sight reading Ruckmanite crowd, they think it's a heresy if anybody comes up with anything that veers anywhere away from something that Dr. Ruckman believed. What do you do when Schofield and Darby and Ruckman and Larkin all disagree? They're not always all right. Certain Ruckmanites, certain Ruckmanites we're critical of Brother Sluter. Hey, by the way, look, uh, everybody likes to jump on Ruckman's position about the abortion. You know all about that, that abortion is not murder. Remember you said you thought Dr. Ruckman changed his position? I just happened to see that sermon at Peacock's church. That was the first sermon I was watching where he said, and he, he mentions that about you know, abortion being murder. He slipped it in. He didn't say, you know, I've been wrong for years, but I heard him say that. He's an older guy. Do you know Curtis Hudson, when he was dying with cancer, gave out 500 copies of Gail Ripplinger's book to all his preacher friends and said he was wrong about the King James Bible? He wouldn't give Ruckman's book out because he couldn't admit that still. Dying or no dying, amen. Dr. Ruckman kind of reversed that abortion position. But I knew that was wrong all along. Yeah. Because it says in Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the womb, in the belly, I knew thee. And not that I have any fresh air to breathe yet, just to be a person. <laughs> the Holy Spirit used Brother Sluter to clarify Old Testament salvation a couple of years ago on his, one of his programs. He didn't even know that he did it till I told it to him after the broadcast and he had to go back and look at it. Do you remember that? God gave you an unbelievable insight to the, the, the number one debatable issue. How do people get saved in the Old Testament? Nobody ever got saved in the Old Testament because there was no eternal security in the Old Testament. So you either died in the right state with God or you did, but nobody was ever saved. The whole nomenclature is crazy. But then Dr. Sluter, I mean, Brother Sluter did it in a way that I've never read or heard Doc do it. You know what he was doing? He was building on Dr. Ruckman's take 
on Exodus 35, 7, about God will forgive your sins, but you can't be cleared. And he went along and said, you know, a person who dies right with God, if he's a Jew, because he's trying to follow the law, and if he's a Gentile without the Mosaic law in his hands, he's got the law in his heart, and he's got his conscience, and if he's trying to follow his conscience, okay, and the either Jew or Gentile die in a state, nobody's looking at the cross. And listen, some of these crazy people, Brother Melton's a good guy, I just mentioned him as a good guy, but he's talking about people in the Old Testament who were looking forward to the cross, but they didn't know they were looking forward to the cross. That's crazy. Where's the, where's the camera? Is that the camera? Brother Melton, you're a nice guy, but that's nuts. But I like you. I just plugged you a minute ago. My man's got a big picture in his office, in his, uh, uh, a big painting of Patrick Henry. He's a direct descendant of Patrick Henry. He's a hard-working preacher, but he's crazy about that one thing. But see, he's, he's right on about other things. This is the period of judges, and you better wake up to realize it, or you're going to go nuts. Right. That's good. You know what he said? He said if some Jew or Gentile died in the Old Testament trying to please God, following the light that God gave him, hey, he got the mercy of God. So when he died, he didn't go into the same fire the rich man is in in Luke 16. God let him slide into paradise because of his mercy. Amen. He's not saved yet. He's got to wait for Jesus to come down. Amen. Like Peter talks about, preaching the gospel to them that were dead. And brother, there nobody says, I don't think I want to get saved, Jesus. And then they get the grace of God when the Lord shows up and they all go to heaven. And he leads them captivity captive. Amen. That's all. That's nothing to it. They're given mercy when they die and they don't go to hell. But that can't get them to heaven yet till they hear the gospel. Duh, that was pretty good for me. I never heard anything like that. That guy come up with that. Cross references Exodus 35, 7 with Deuteronomy 5, 10, showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And then cross reference with 1 Peter 4, verse 6, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. Brother Chad Reese is another up and coming good student of the word of God. He come up with that 7,000 years. Brother, brother, he has a funny accent. You ever hear him? Brother, brother. Uh, there, you know, 88 reasons why Jesus was coming, 88, 89 reasons why they're all messed up. They were, count, they were counting out two days from the church age from the birth of Christ, amen. Didn't work out. The testament is not enforced until his death on the testator, amen. You got to start in 33 AD, amen. And take 33 AD and put 2,000 years in that, and you, could, and you got the second day being done in 2033, uh, amen. And go back uh, uh, four years because the calendar's off. Jesus was born four years before he was born, 4 BC. You come back to 2029, amen. Take seven years off of the tribulation period, and you're at 2022, amen. Now, he's not saying that's when the Lord's coming back, but you know what? That made me decide to put off buying my cemetery plot. <laughs> I was going to buy a cemetery plot. I'm, at the time, in the last days, they're going to they're going to lose their conscience. We're going to lose our vision that the Lord's coming back. That's what Peter says. We're not denying them. We're just not hearing the preaching anymore. We're getting uh, yeah. 2022. I can do that. I can do that. Jack Hiles said when he was a young preacher in Texas, you're like 20 something years old, and everybody was preaching and setting the dates for the Lord coming. It was real popular back then. He said, I wouldn't do that. He said, I just told my church though that the Lord's coming back this year. I'm not setting a date sometime this year. And they said, well, how did it go? He said, well, December was wild. He said, January was a little tough. <laughs> yeah. There's another good brother, George Antonius in Montreal, born in Lebanon, speaks fluent Arabic, pastors a strong King James Bible believing church, small work, very brilliant man. He comes up with a lot of wild things, and I don't know if they're right or not, but they're wild, and he's got scripture for it, and he works overtime studying. He's really a diligent guy, but the main thing is he's sincere as the day is long. Hey, we got some good holy men here, God's letting us have. I'm thinking of all these young guys down here with Sluter saying, I'm going to kick the bucket pretty soon. Look at all these young guys coming up now. 
Brother Antonius, he, he thinks that, they, you know, the flood wrecked the, the topography and the geography of so many things on this planet, you know. He said he thinks before the flood that the Garden of Eden is where Jerusalem is tonight. And that's why, and he's got 2,000 verses for it. I don't know if it's all right. It's so deep, I can't hardly follow it yet. It takes time to get through it. But he's studying and working hard. He might be finding stuff that Dr. Ruckman ran out of time to find. I'm standing at that, that Perkins restaurant down there where I just told you I went to the little shrine today. I can see him sitting there with me saying, you know about the, the zodiacs, the 12, the, the 12 uh, zones up there, what do you call them things? You know, them up there in the sky, the 12 different, uh, somebody help me, Jesus. The, who, the, the consolation. He says, somebody's got to study that out. I don't have any time to do that anymore. I'm running out of time. Listen, I left the Catholic Church because I wouldn't listen to a pope. When you got Ruckmanites that are so blockheaded and crazy and they can't study for themselves, what did the doctor say? What did Dr. Ruckman say? If he didn't say it, it can't be true. Watch out for those people. They're crazy. They're stinking crazy and they're doing disservice to his legacy. What do you think he was trying to teach people to do? Study that Bible. You know what Jack Howells always said? Nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. All that Bible study is an enemy of soul winning. We got to go soul winning all the time. Yeah. Ruckman said if there's not more stuff to find, why did God tell us to study? Right. You're yeah. supposed to find stuff in there that any, no one's found yet. Amen. Right. I think they're coming around a little bit more. Where do you see this thing? This is a medieval torture device. <laughs> you know how many people are saying, I want to go home, but I can't wait to see what that is. I'm not stupid. Hey, you know what? I just, see, if you don't agree with Dr. Ruckman, that's the unpardonable sin. That's the bottom line for these crazy people. Now listen, George Antonius, he just put a video out on 2 Thessalonians 2, that day of the Christ stuff. You know what he said? He said, you know, for years, he, he's got an accent 10 times crazier than Brother Reese. A, a French Canadian accent. You know, for years, uh, I haven't been able to get that thing figured out in my head yet. And, and to be honest with you, I, I love Dr. Ruckman because he's taught me 90% of what I know. But when I go to that 2 Timothy, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 in his commentary, I don't understand. It doesn't make any sense to me. I saw that on a video the other day. I said, glory to God. Dr. Ruckman's commentary on 2 Thessalonians 2 is as clear as mud. Yeah. I've thought that forever. I've never been able to get it figured out one bit. I bought this suit in California. I asked the pastor. He was a strong student. I said, you got any good insight on 2 Thessalonians 2? He said, yeah, he's scratching his head. He gave me something, but that's a fuzzy area. And George Antonius just put a video out on it explaining it. The day of Christ is talking about the, uh, the second advent as well as it can be the rapture or it can be the second advent. It's the day of the Lord in the Old Testament that Jesus wasn't revealed in the Old Testament. New Testament, you know who he is. He's Jesus now. And sometimes the day of Christ can be the day of the Lord. Long story short, I can't explain all this stuff to you right now. I'm making a point. Wouldn't you like to know that God would be touching different men between now and the rapture to help us get a little more light on what's going on? rather than being locked in like a cult member, as a crazy person. You know, there's an old expression, I forget what it is. The great, well, you, somebody can help me here, you've heard it. The greatest uh, way you can compliment a man is to go past, a follower can compliment his leader is to go past them. Haven't you all heard that, some of you? I forget the wording of it. Amen. That's what they're hoping you're gonna do. Heresy! Doc didn't say that. Heresy! Yo! Honor Dr. Ruckman's legacy by continuing to study. He would smile over your discoveries. Now, of course, there's a problem, though. What I just told you, liberty opens the door to anything goes. You all heard of a three-and-a-half-year tribulation period? You know, I read a book the other day somebody gave me to read up in Alaska. Somebody wrote. It's got a, it's a theory, it's a thesis. They wanted to know what I thought of it. The whole thesis of the, of the book is that the tribulation period lasts 10 years. The Holy Spirit didn't bear witness with my spirit for one second on that. And some guy who's a very sincere guy, and if I told you who it was, you'd have a heart attack. Three quarters of the room would know who it was. 
I'll never tell, except in private. <laughs> say, what do you do when you got the, the see, in, the judge, in this period of judges spiritually, when different men are studying the Bible and they start coming up with strange things, what do you do about that? How about letting the Holy Spirit lead you Amen. to decide what's true? What a, what a novel thought that is. And then no, and here's something else very important. You better earn the right to become an internet authority. I preached this sermon at your church, and some guy was at that meeting, and he, all he did was tell me how many screwed up things he was into, Calvinism, this and that, one crazy doctrinal problem after another that he, you know, he got pulled out of it by somebody else, one crazy mess after another. And he heard my sermon, and he went off the deep end for, for hallelujah, and now he's on the internet. You know what I'm talking about? He's writing articles about every key doctrinal position, correcting preachers left and right, and he's a nice guy, but he's a dweeb. <laughs> Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. The guy is kind of a, he's a dipstick, let's just put it that way. He's a dipstick, not because of what he, of, because of himself. He's a dipstick because of all of a sudden he's asserting himself as a great authority and he hasn't earned the right to do it yet. That's the problem. You're going to be in the book of Judges now. Every man's running wild. There's no more Dr. Ruckman going to be on the scene. And then number three, remember the temptation. If you're in a Ruckmanite camp, don't forget what it is. It's the fine stuff that God hasn't even heard of yet. <laughs> That's the temptation to the Ruckman group. That's not a house problem. Yeah. They don't know any Bible. The Ruckman crowd, you, if you don't have something, it's a terrible temptation. I, I hope somebody knows what I'm, I, this is a deep message. I can't help it. I'll be here Sunday. I'll give, come right back down to shallow stuff. Number one, honor doctor's, Doc's legacy by continuing to study. Number two, honor Doc's legacy by staying humble in the process. Let me tell you something that's gonna blow your mind now. That book I read in 1894, dealing with this thousand generation thing, you ought to get the book and read it. I shared this down in the church in Texas. The place went nuts. The preacher bought every copy of that book that was available, gave it to all the men in this church for Father's Day. They took a picture of all the men up on the platform holding their copy of the book and mailed it to me. The preacher said it turned them upside down. But wait a minute, this is Brother Gunther's church. You understand that? You kind of go through him and let him coach you. I'm not trying to get you to go do anything. I don't even know what Brother Gunther thinks. I don't even know if he believes in the Bible. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, but I'm, but I'm, I'm making a point. I'm, I'm, I was just excited about that book and I wanted to make a point. One of the things that guy said in the book, you want to hear something deep? He said, if you're standing on the beach, you'll never forget this illustration if you hear it once. If you're standing at the beach, look, and the water's rushing up on the sand, right? Going over your ankles and going past you a little bit like it'll do, right? He said, look down at all that foamy water around your ankles, right? He said, that water you can see around your ankles represents the truth of the Bible that God has opened up to your understanding, that inspiration thing. That's the Bible that you know. The rest of it's out there. That quote blew me into next week. That's pre-Facebook, pre-television, pre-radio, 1894. Stay humble. We're not so smart. We try to kill each other over doctrinal nuances where we disagree with each other. That's the rest of the Bible out there. That's all you know right there. Gold in my ear used to say, don't act so humble, you're not that important. Number three, oh, by the way, a great verse for what I just told you, I'll quote it to you, don't turn to it. Philippians 2, 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. As good as this sermon is right now, your sermon was better. Who believes that? <laughs> Number three, honor Doc's legacy by agreeing to disagree. Chad Reese and Randy Keener disagree on the gap theory, right? Andrew Sluter had one of the greatest insights to Old Testament salvation I have ever heard. Dr. Ruckman didn't even deal with it like that. He didn't even know what he, what he said. God just gave it to him. 
but he doesn't have church membership at his church. I don't think he likes chick tracks. What are we going to do with him now? He knows more Bible than most people, most preachers twice his age. He's only 27. What are we going to do? Cut his throat because he doesn't like chick tracks? My wife doesn't like chick tracks. I'm not going to divorce her over. Do I, should I go on with all the other weird things you believe? Or? Are you seeing what I'm telling you? What are, you gonna do? what are we going to do? Are we Baptist or not? He doesn't believe that Jesus is... is listen, you want to get mad at somebody? Go look at stinking nut job. Uh, Joel Osteen's nut job wife. Look at her talking to 2,000 women where she, where she says on a video, Jesus was not God. He was a human. But God touched them with a spark of divinity. Go watch her telling her that to 2,000 Christian women. Go get, don't say, send her an email. None of us have our act together. We just have our ankles a little wet. That's all it is. Several other areas can be concentrated on. I've titled this message, here's the crazy part, ready? I've titled this message, Reformation of Ruckmanism. Whack job Stephen Anderson, he's, he calls his movement the new IFB. The new independent fundamental Baptist. What's wrong with having a, a little wonderful informal movement? We just call ourselves the new Ruckmanites. Straightening up, shoring up things, getting our act together in a sense. By the way, I could care less what Stephen Anderson would think about this message. Could care less. I always think of that scene from uh, Braveheart. When that king's standing there with that queer next to him, and the queer's talking to him, and he says, who is this that thinks I need to know? He won't even look at him. That's my attitude towards Stephen Anderson. And I'd throw him out a stinking window if I could. Hey, here's the good news. Martin Luther, he had the reformation of Romanism. Remember that? You know how many points he had in his message? He had 95 points. My message is the reformation of Ruckmanism. I only have eight points. And I'm half done, and the rest of them are going to go quick. But you don't want to leave till you see this. <laughs> Trust me, you don't want to leave till you see this. You have no idea where we're going. <laughs> Every boy and girl in town. <laughs> okay. I remember, I just had a flashback in my apartment in New York, and I'm 10 years old, laying on the floor with a broken down record player playing the limbo rock. By, over and over and over laid on the floor. Oh, it's a miracle God uses any of us. Amen. Number four, honor, God, honor Doc's legacy by not dropping Baptist. Amen. And that's a real weakness among Bible believers because they think all strong Baptists have to be Baptist briders. You need to read Clarence Larkin's Double Works, Dispensational Truth on this side and this book here, Why I'm a Baptist. No time to go on to all that. And that makes me think of that Phil Kidd, major blowhard compromise that just dropped Baptist from his church in Tennessee, Emmaus of Kingsport now, rather than Emmaus Baptist Church. Big blowhard, Phil Kidd. People think he walks on water. He's a compromising blowhard. I put that on his blog. Keep Baptist on your sign. I won't preach for a church if it's not a Baptist church. It's just the way it is. Number five, you're going to love this one. Honor Doc's legacy by getting some class. Jack Patterson said, the first time I ever learned anything about Ruckmanites, this is what he said. First time I learned what Ruckmanites even were. I just heard Dr. Ruckman's tapes, and I was getting ready to run to some church to hear him. And Jack warned me, he said, I just got to tell you about Ruckmanites. What is it, Brother Jack? He said, they're a little different. Dr. Ruckman was the one who said, the brighter the light bulb, the more bugs it attracts. The very first time I preached for Dr. Ruckman, four times I preached for him. The first time I preached for him, the first of three or four sermons, I stood behind the pulpit. The only thing they knew about me was my book, Final Authority, that they were starting to sell already. Look, I got up there. How you doing, everybody? I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Dr. Ruckman. Oh, by the way, somebody told me these would hurt me down here, and I threw up my arms, and I showed two cufflinks. And I said, I've been told that these are going to hurt me down here. <laughs> you know what I was telling everybody? You don't like cufflinks? Don't wear them. Yeah. But I like them. Thank you. Yeah. Some of us were men before we were saved. There was a man 
called a man of God named John. Next. Oh, I know what I want to say. You know, some of, the, some of the craziest people I've ever seen can be Ruckmanites that are imbalanced, unhinged crazies, especially in their street preaching. I'll be street preaching in Branson, Missouri for Pastor Dave Wagner next week, but he's got some class in how he does it. Hey, don't be in your underwear with a megaphone looking crazy and screaming. When Jack Pat, when I go down to the blowouts, listen, I'm talking about class now. Can I teach you about class? When I go down to the Pensacola, I worked on Park Avenue before I got saved. I don't know everything, but I, I, know, I know a little bit about some class. Look at this suit I'm wearing, $19.95. When I go down to the blowout to hear, to preach down there with the, at the meetings, everybody go to the restaurants when the services are over. You know, if you've ever been down there, that one main strip of restaurants and hotels everywhere, and I'd always hang around with Jack, we'd go in together, and he'd have all the girls from his singing group sitting in there, but inevitably, he'd get them to start singing in the restaurant, okay? Now, I know most of you think that's cute, but I happen to know better. Not everybody wants to hear a bunch of Christians singing while they're eating a meal that they paid for. See, now you learned something. I bet you don't even know how to give a track to some. Some of you don't know how to give a track to somebody. In Mexico, you can throw them out the window and they'll kill each other to get a track. In Western America, you don't, you don't walk up to somebody and say, here, this is for you, read this. In America, they're proud. You say, can I give you something from my church, sir? I'm a, I'm a hillbilly preacher from Tennessee. Can I leave you something from, I, that's how I give them out. You don't force them on people. You have to have some class. And if you're street preaching, you don't go to a movie theater when everybody's lined up on, to get a ticket and they can't go anywhere and you blast them where they're stuck on the line. Does anybody understand what I've been saying for the last three minutes? Amen. You're scaring me now, man. I'm talking about having some class. Right. Oh, I got to get to my clothesline. Okay, all right. Let me skip a bunch of stuff here. I've all, <laughs> never mind. Ruckmanites need to learn how to give fu do funerals and weddings. Quit making fun of Jack Howes. The Howes people have the four-point handkerchief, five points, I call them five-pointers, five-point Calvins. They got five-point handkerchiefs and their cufflinks and their little cross pens and all the Lord, things like that, right? Now, listen, that looks kind of silly on the outside, but sometimes some Ruckmanites can use a couple ounces of that. You already got the book. What's wrong with building on the book? You're so blessed. And I keep saying you, but I don't, this is like my sermon at Clarence, Clarence Sexton's church. They thought I was attacking the people. The camera was on and it was 25 colleges out there supposedly listening to me. I'm preaching everybody across the, the internet land. I like you people, you know I do. Okay, I'll tell you what, let's end with the killer one, okay? I'll jump to the eighth point, get that out of the way, and end on the killer seventh point. How's that? The eighth point is the divorce and remarriage. He covered it already. Here, here, here's what I'd say to Ruckmanites. Hey, hey, why don't, you, why don't you learn how to love your wives if you're a typical Ruckmanite that doesn't have any kind of sane home life? Learn to love your wife. Bill Grady worships the ground my wife walks on because I was a typical dud husband for 25, 30 years. You want to know what I was like? Watch Home Alone one time. When they're in the, when they're in the truck at the end of the movie, the, you know, the polka band, and Candy says to the lady, now take Joe over there. He doesn't even know how many kids he has. And, and take Bill, the guy driving. He doesn't even know what his kids' names are. Most men spend their earlier part of their marriage like that, trying to keep the wolf off the porch, and it's a blur, you know, they don't know what's going on, and then they wake up, they start realizing, good night, what a good woman God gave me. She put up with all this nonsense, and they spin around and love their wives, worship their wives. I heard Dr. Ruckman today, today, today I heard him on a tape say, you guys think I'm a bad, I'm a bad uh, married man? Ask my wife if I don't take her on an overseas honeymoon every year. Some country. I got a maid comes in to help her do the housework two days a week. Go ask her how she's mistreated. He's laughing at everybody. Brother, some of the Ruckmanites are like cavemen, beating their wife over the head with a club and dragging her around. That's why there's so many divorces. Okay, 
Let's get to the clothesline. Number eight and final. Brother Sluter, you need to start my car up and warm it up. Uh, oh, I missed one. Good night. I missed one here. I'll, I'll just hit it and run. I missed number six. You're making me nervous up here, and I'm not following my notes very carefully. Number six was Honor Doc's legacy by soul winning and church building. John Paisley graduated from Dr. Ruckman's school when he hooked up with a Tennessee Temple graduate, and they went to pastor school every year together, and he's pastoring the largest church in the eight northwestern states right now. He got really good and balanced. You've heard me tell you before, a soul is a mind, emotion, and a will, right? The mind is the, is the doctrine, that's the Ruckman crowd, right? The heart, the emotion, that's the camp meeting crowd. And the will, that's the fundamentalist crowd. Know, feel, and do. Go pass out tracks, go soul winning, go run a bus route. See that thing? That's the do stuff. Know, feel, and do. You gotta put all three together. That, that's what you gotta do. Hey, look, neighbor, what do you think I did? I come out of house camp, and I learned the Bible at the Ruckman camp. I, and I tell the Ruckmanites, why don't you get something that houses God? And they look at me like I'm crazy. And brother, go to Sluter's meetings and watch the Holy Ghost come down in the camp meeting style worship service, and you'll, you'll think you're in another dispensation. <laughs> Yankees got to learn about that worship stuff. Okay, here we go. Here we go. I'm done with this. Number, number eight, put your seatbelt on. We need to honor Doc's legacy, right? By, don't miss this word, exceeding, exceeding, exceeding his positions on dress standards. Okay, turn to 2 Timothy 4 real quick. See, turn to 2 Timothy 4. I'll make this very pain, painless and quick. Okay, you want it in the throat or the heart, or where do you want it? See, you don't travel like I do and other evangelists do. Can I tell you what a typical Ruckmanite church is like when you go in there? Can I tell you what it's like? The men start coming into the service wearing shorts, flip-flops on their feet, and coffees in their hand. Talk to me. I see it all the time. That doesn't honor God one bit because you wouldn't dress that way at your mother's funeral. I saw, I saw Tebow uh, sitting on a stool at, a, at an Easter service in some big mega church. Are you listening, Tim Tebow? With his ripped up jeans, you know, and his colored t-shirt. You know, it's just this wild, you know, crazy modern day church look, you know, with a microphone talking on a stool in a big church service on Easter, talking about how much he loved Jesus. The next week I saw him giving an interview, not over, uh, over some uh, job position for the New York Mets or something he was getting ready to do. It was a sports interview and he was sitting there, brother, with a suit and a tie on. Second Timothy 4, 3, the time will come when they will not, what? Endure sound doctrine. Didn't say they wouldn't believe it. They said they wouldn't endure it. Now, with that in mind, turn to Titus 2 real quick. Turn to Titus 2. I'm giving you Bible-believing people across mega internet space out there something to think about. All right? Now, this is when I come now and let us reason together. Remember that verse? That's what I'm doing right here. Look at Titus 2 real quick. Verse number 1. But speak thou the things which become, what's the next two words? Sound doctrine. Now, would you like to know what sound doctrine was in the first century? Paul said that in the end of the church age, the Christians are not going to endure sound doctrine anymore. You understand? Now, what is sound doctrine? The Trinity and pre-tribulation rapture? Well, pay attention. You'll see what it is. Here it is. That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in the faith, in charity and patience. That's part of sound doctrine. What's that got to do with theology? Don't pass out. We, you, we're going somewhere. Verse 3, how many of you ladies would admit that you're an aged woman in here? We got one hand back. I was just kidding. I, <laughs> Gordy Howe's wife raised the head. I didn't mean you to do that. I don't, I don't agree that you're an aged woman. The, look at verse 3. The aged women likewise, that they may behave as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. You want to see what sound doctrine is? Verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. You all see that? 
to be discreet. Would you tell me what the next word is? Chaste. Part of the sound doctrine of a New Testament church is older ladies teaching younger women to be chaste. You know what Webster says chaste is? Applied to persons before marriage, it signifies pure from all sexual, don't miss the next word, commerce. Undefiled, applied to married persons, true to the marriage bed. Don't miss this, I've thought out every word I'm saying here. Dress standards relate to sexual commerce via the advertising department. Those light bulbs are starting to hum, brother. <laughs> Let me read that again. Applied to persons before marriage, it signifies pure from all sexual commerce, undefiled. Dress standards, this is my wording now, dress standards relate to sexual commerce via the advertising department. You say, Brother Grady, Doc, Dr. Ruckman didn't push dress standards. Duh, haven't you been listening to me yet? Only the Pope is infallible. Dr. Ruckman wouldn't let somebody come to church naked. Every preacher believes in some dress standards. It's how strict are you with your standards? How much of the body do you show? No naked preacher, no naked couple is going to walk into Doc's church. I'm saying we might think about honoring Doc's legacy by exceeding his positions. All I'm saying is, why don't you consider some of the stuff the house camp specialized in? I taught them to learn the King James Bible because of your position. Stay with me, neighbor. Ruckmanites equate preaching on standards as excessive pastoral authority. I let the King James Bible tell the people what to do. I don't tell them what to do. That's what you hear all the time. But I've heard Dr. Ruckman many times make the same statement. You know what he said? The best churches I've ever seen were pastored by dictators. Because somebody had to keep the little dictators from taking over. That's an exact quote. So you've got to listen to everything. The present point, or last point number eight, is to honor Doc's legacy by exceeding his position. Now watch this. Turn to 1 Timothy 2. I'm almost done, but I've saved the best for last. And you know where I'm going here? This is a 100% appeal deal, right? I'm not preaching to anybody. I'm an evangelist, goes in other different churches, and now I've got all these people supposedly listening on the internet, so I don't know who I'm dealing with, but this is an appeal I'm making. I'm trying to get you to think, and I'm going to show you something in closing that I think will be a help to you, okay? Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. If you've got a Schofield reference Bible, 1 Timothy 2, the little heading there says, Division of the Sexes. Division of the Sexes. And by the way, Watch this now. Bill Grady, the guy talking to you right now, I've earned the right to touch on this for two reasons. Number one, I lost 90% of my church in Swartz Creek over this issue, and I'd do it tomorrow again. Again. And number two, listen to this, going to hair lip somebody for good. This is meant to be presented in the good spirit. I was up at 4.30 this morning praying about this, right? So I know God's helping me. I got 13 females in my family. A wife, a daughter, two daughter-in-laws, and nine granddaughters. You follow me? My wife is the only one out of those 13 that, that follows what I'm preaching to you right now. Everybody, every female in my family, besides, except for my wife, wears pants. That's my own family. That's how, that's how much of an influence I've been able to be, and I love every one of them, of course and the, some of the best preachers across America that I preach for. Their families wear pants, the women do. You understand that? There's no, you, can't win, you can't win for losing on this business. But a preacher is supposed to preach what he believes is right. And I, I know, all, but I know the, most of the house people, they don't have a problem with this issue, but they don't know right division from a right hook, but they know dress standards. Stay with me now, neighbor. I'm almost done. If you go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, deal with the men of the church. 
and he switches to the women in verse number 9. Verse 1, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, right? And on it goes down there. Verse, uh, verse 8, when he's all done, I will therefore that what? Men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, right? Schofield again says the division of the sexes. That's at the head of chapter 2. The first eight ver chapter 1 is an introduction to the pastoral material. God's talk, uh, uh, speaking to Timothy through Paul, and he's, a, he's, 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 he's approaching him, and he's getting ready to give him positions on the church. The very first thing he does now is divide the men from the women. And the second thing he does is address the men first. And now when he's all done with the men, he's going to start with the women of the New Testament church. Would you look at verse 9? In like manner also. Ten subjects are covered through the end of that chapter. I used to have a lecture. I taught pastoral epistles for 10 years at Jack House College. And I, there are 10 teachings starting at verse 9, ending at verse 15 for the New Testament women. 10. Do you want to see what the first one is the Holy Spirit deals with? In that order, verse 9, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves, right? In what? Modest apparel. Isn't that interesting? Modest is in line with that word chaste. You know what Webster says? Modest is? Listen to this. Properly restrained, you're not going to believe this, by a sense of propriety. Hence, watch it, not forward or bold, not presumptuous. Watch it. Do you get this? Women are supposed to be submissive to the man. Is that right? When a woman trades a dress for a pair of trousers, she has now gotten forward. She is now equal with that man without realizing that she is. My daughter wears pants. She doesn't think about that. Not for a minute is she thinking about that. You know, the devil is a real scam artist, con man, is he not? Is he a great deceiver? Now, let me show you something. I don't think I can get any further than this. I'm, this is the last page of my notes. Uh, <laughs> ERA movement, Eve ruined Adam, remember that? Does anybody, would anybody like to know where the pants movement came from? I read an article in Encyclopedia Britannica about it. It said for 200 years, dresses and skirts were the norm for women in this country. In the 1960s, it all changed. And it, ironically, the period, the last 60 years of women wearing pants parallels the modern Bible era. The Bible believers are supposed to know the book. The RSV comes out in 1952. And you know who started this whole thing? You know what Encyclopedia Britannica said? Three whores in Hollywood, if you want to know who they are. He didn't call them whores, but they are whores. Greta Garbo, Marlena Dietrich, who had an affair with John Kennedy when she was in her 60s, and both of them followed the number one whore of all. She was called the patron saint of independent American females. I wonder if you know who I'm talking about. Her nickname was Kate. Catherine Hepburn, who said that from the age of nine, she wanted to be a boy and thought she was a boy. She even gave herself a boy's name, Jimmy. She told Barbara Walters in 1981, I have not lived as a woman. I have lived as a man. She was the number one pioneer of trousers. Hey, the movie directors hated her wearing pants during the casual time on the movie sets that when she was in an acting scene wearing what she should have acted, they would break into her trailer and steal her pants. This is America, how it used to be. She would come back into her trailer looking for her pants, and when she, she realized they took them, she'd go back out and sit down on the set with underwear on, no clothes at all, just her underwear until they gave her her pants back. Anybody interested in history? This is the one, Britannica says, pioneered the pants on women movement. And then she got barred from one hotel after another wearing pants in the lobby. She'd go through the service entry rather than give up her pants. Oh, and by the way, here's her famous quote on God. Quote, 
I am an atheist, and that's it. I believe there's nothing we can know except that we should be kind to each other and do what we can for people. She died in 2003 and found out there was a God, right? Amen. Okay. Now here's, a, here's the end of the message. Turn to Deuteronomy 22. Last major verse for you. We know, we know all about Deuteronomy 22 and watch this. I got a Ruckman reference Bible right here. And, uh, and Dr. Ruckman, bless his heart, you know, he kind of give you a little wiggle room on that issue by talking about men wearing robes. And I know all about that. I know all about that. So I know where I'm going. And remember, all I'm doing is giving you something to think about. I went to Idaho to start a church in 1981. Them women up there carry guns, ride Brahma bulls, tr drive trucks. Some of the toughest women in America. And I taught this in that church and everybody overnight, everybody in my church, every lady in the church, threw her pants out the window. I don't know what happened. Of course, that was a long time ago, 1981. Now remember, Brother Grady can't even get his own family to listen to him, so don't get excited, all right? <laughs> Is anybody home? Anybody home? This is what you've all been waiting for. How many of you got to use the bathroom in the worst way? I ain't leaving. <laughs> Brother Gunther, I sure hope I'm going to come back here sometime. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you, neighbor. Stay with me now, neighbor. This is worth it. Talk to me now. Don't get quiet on me back there. Okay. Okay. You ready, neighbor? I don't want to be indecent here. Okay, what does it say in Deuteronomy 22.5? The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. Is that what it says? Forget about the garments that are in question. Forget about them. There's no cameras. Nobody knows what in the snot anybody was wearing. But can anybody understand what you just read? What did God say he wanted? Who can't follow this? God tells you as clear as the nose on your face that he wants a distinction, a visible distinction between the sexes. A man shall not wear that which pertains to a woman, neither shall a woman put on a man's garment. God does not want them looking the same regardless of what the stinking clothes are. The principle is what you better see. And it's so important that God says, if you destroy that distinction, I consider that an abomination. Like bestiality is an abomination. Like homosexuality is an abomination. Like witchcraft is an abomination. Breaking down a distinction between the sexes visibly is an abomination to God. Brother Reese, there's your gap theory. Can I get a witness? Is there, is there a gap? Now listen, you may, you'll probably thank me the rest of your Christian life for this. Stay with me, neighbor. Thank you. Here's, here's Catherine Hepburn. She wants to be like a man. Dallas Dobson used to say, here's the zipper. Dallas Dobson used to say, you can't fool God by moving the zipper. Is there, is there a difference between those pants and these pants? The zipper's over here on the side, and here's the man's zipper in the front. There's a difference, yes. Look at the gap now. Take a good look at the gap. Which gap is bigger? This one or this one? 
you throw this away and you exchange it for this, it's okay, there's still a difference, yes. It's just a lot less. And for 200 years in America, the gap was like that. Yeah. And since the 1960s and three whores in Hollywood, the gap is here. Right. This is the last shock for the night and I'm done. <laughs> Zippers in the front now, new style. Okay, it's time to move it again. So, if your zippers, <laughs> see that thing? That's Satan. That is Satan. He did that for some of you. You're praying already. I can't stand any more of this. <laughs> Notice how nobody's helping me. I'm here by myself now, breaking my fingers. It's okay, it's okay. Don't act like you care. Look at this thing. That's a good illustration of what I, hey listen, here, look here, your neighbor. Take the other one off, that's the point. This one has been replaced by this one. Now, thank you, brother. Lord, I just asked you to go easy on me, okay? Look, neighbor, now that's where we are. You know, it, you know, it would be really cool if somebody could actually get what I'm saying. There's your gap now. Okay? Zippers in the front, zippers in the front. I, I don't know what the difference is between a man's slacks now and a, and a woman's slacks with this, bit, with this business here. But the point I'm making is that was the gap before for 200 years. And now it's been reduced to this. If Whatever Deuteronomy 22.5 is telling you is when God says, I want a man and a woman to look different. And what I'm getting at is this. Does anybody have any idea how much inspiration it must take for me to be preaching this here? You know how many meetings I'm going to have canceled because of this? Probably. And I'm going to really worry about it while I'm driving my Honda. I wonder how God's going to take care of me now. You know, I wonder if God's going to abandon me now. But you know what I think the Lord put on my heart? If I was a Christian woman, you know what I'd want to do? I'd want to do my part now, not only just to pray against abortion, but to realize how I can be a missionary for the Lord. Because any man in this room will tell you, if a guy's in Walmart and a woman walks by with a cart and she's got a knee-length skirt on of some kind, you know, you know what that unsaved man will say? That's a religious woman. That's what any man will think. And I would want to do my part, and if there was ever a time to just pray about this, all, this, this helped my church, big time. Northwest people, tobacco chewing people. Here's the thought. Does anybody realize wh where we are tonight in the transgender nightmare? Where do you think it came from? I heard Jack Howes preach a sermon in 1976 called the Unisex Movement. He said, this is where it's going, and he predicted where we are right now. It's that if I was a Christian woman, I'd want to kind of reverse Catherine Hepburn's influence and go back to letting people know that I, um, I'm not ashamed of looking like this. Just a thought. It's just an innocent thought. I'll quit with this. Most of you know who Joe Arthur is, well-known preacher, camp meeting preacher. I was with him recently in a meeting, and I'm done with this, not even a long story. I just want to show you how desperately God needs our movement in a reformed status. You ready, neighbor? He came up to me after preaching for an hour and a half, one of the better messages I've ever heard him preach. He came to me by my book table. I wasn't preaching, I was just selling books, and he was kind of crying in private to me. He said, Brother Bill, in five years from now, the old time religion in this country will probably be gone. And then he walked away. Oh, by the way, he was the main speaker that week. In the daytime, all three of the main speakers in the daytime, just quoting the Greek, quoting the Greek, quoting the Greek, quoting the Greek. King James only camp meeting. Yeah. 
pastor, a sincere man. But when I wasn't doing this, hearing these Southern theologians waxing eloquent about agape phileo stuff, like David Gibbs was at Sammy Allen's camp meeting last year, charity should be love. They have never got it straight yet. Look, when I wasn't doing that because of the Greek, I was doing that watching all the Southern gospel groups are up there performing. Performing. I couldn't, I, I couldn't stand it. Fun, the old time religion's gonna be gone. That was the meeting he was preaching. What I'm saying is the Bible believing movement, we're all that's left. We're that remnant that's with right. God's back. What's wrong with trying to get as close to God as we might could for the last battles? That makes sense to me. I've only been at this 45 years. But I have gained from the Ruckman position. He's my hero. He always will be. And, 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 and I love his memory because he changed my entire life. But what's wrong with trying to put more in your, in your cart? Anything wrong with that? Let's bow our heads for prayer. I have never preached this message before. Oh, I did it with Gunther's church. The only reason, I mean, I did it at Sluter's church. The only reason we redid it was because the devil got into his equipment there and fouled the whole recording up. And, brother, and, and listen, your pastor heard this message. And he wanted, he didn't, I didn't have the clothesline illustration, but I touched on dress standards. He wanted me to preach it here to you. You know? You know, Dr. Ruckman's uh, used to cry about uh, nobody used the altar when he preached. They, that's my biggest burden. Nobody would use the altar when I preached. And then he said, I had to come up with a theory as to why that was. I guess I just stripped them naked, you know, in their, in their thinking. I threw so much, you know, raw truth at them, they felt naked and move. I'll say that many times. Well, <clears throat> Ruck, Ruckman churches should, should use the altars. And I've been at this church enough to know people use the altars. But for those of you listening, I don't know who you are. But... Uh, Maybe tonight God has spoken to somebody about, covered eight different subjects. Maybe God spoke to you about something. Maybe you'd like to seal it with a decision at the altar before we go home tonight. Hey, we, we, the, 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 this country needs what's left. We're that little remnant at the end of the, at the, end of the tabernacle, that cloth. That's, that's, that's all God has now, rear guard action. We're not very important on paper, but to God we are very important. Maybe you ought to be thinking about your role in these last days. And let something that was said tonight make you at least think. Ask God about some of this stuff. See if he doesn't speak to your heart about something. Let's stand to our feet. <coughs> Heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm going to have a word of prayer. And it's later than, than normal. Brother Sluter was a last minute idea. And, and I'm so glad I heard what he had to say. But, you know... The Lord may have some very important things He wants to put on your heart before you go home. You ought to know what they are by now. Let the Lord have His way. Father, I pray that You'll help us now. In these closing moments of invitation, speak to some hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our heads bowed and eyes closed. The music's playing. And God's speaking to your heart about anything in this message. Why don't you just use that altar and go against that grain of what Dr. Ruckman used to complain about. If he spoke to your heart, do something about it tonight. Would you do that? Think about that foam on your ankle. Let it humble you. Ask God to show you some more stuff. Dr. Ruckman's gone. He needs some help. He needs his legacy preserved. You think he's up in heaven mad that Chad Reese is thinking about some stuff and George Antonius is finding some things and all these men. You think he's mad about that? That's what he taught a generation of people to try to do.
Amen, amen. Well, listen, I just want to say thank you for coming. We're honored that you'd be with us tonight. And so I was thinking about taking up another offering. And so what I was thinking about doing is what you could do is reach in your...